character building. It's good for you. Yeah. Get over it. Suck it up. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You will be stronger for that. You will be better for that. You will have a competitive advantage. There isn't a lot of sympathy for stress um, as a problem in this country because on top of what I just said, everybody experiences it, right? So you can't talk about the problems of stress and ask people to gonna do something about it because people say, you wanna know about stress? Let me tell you about my day yesterday. <laughs> Let me tell you about how hard, and nobody's helping me deal with that. I'm dealing with it myself. No less you're asking me to increase my taxes to really reduce stress on other people. That's the problem, that's what we're up against. So what, and I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to that, okay? So, so here's, here's where the science can be helpful. There's stress and there's stress, okay? And what I'm gonna do now is, to, my, my focus here is early childhood. My focus is not the causes of stress. My focus is the experience, the biological, physiological experience of stress for young children. And there are basically three levels of stress and they're different from each other and they have different policy implications. The first we'll call positive stress. This is character building stress. Okay? <laughs> No child who's deprived of stressful experiences early on is heading for success, okay? You have to experience stress. You have to learn to deal with it. You have to learn to suck it up and figure out how to cope, okay? So from a physiological point of view, positive stress is brief increases in heart rate and blood pressure and stress hormone levels in the context of supportive relationships. This is the stress associated with the first day in a preschool program being told you have to share your toys, being told you're not the only person in the world, having to go in for a nap when you really want to watch what everybody else is doing, only being allowed to have two cookies instead of 10. I mean, that's getting a shot at the doctor's office. This is all normative, positive stress. It's necessary for healthy development. What children learn in the context of supportive relationships, relationships is they learn how to adapt to stressful experiences. They learn how to cope. It's a critically important normative positive experience. The second level of stress is what we call tolerable stress. These are serious temporary stress responses that are buffered by supportive relationships. By tolerable, I mean it doesn't necessarily do harm, um, but it could, but it doesn't because we help kids deal with something more than just you can't have two more cookies. This is the stress associated with the death of a member of the family, a serious illness or injury in the family, a natural disaster like Hurricane Katrina, an act of terrorism like 9-11 or what children around the world live with on a daily basis. This is not normative kind of stress. This is potentially very threatening, but not everybody who experiences that ends up with post-traumatic stress disorder or some kind of problems. Some kids do and some kids don't. Is it random? No. What determines it? Anytime anybody ever asks you any question about what the cause of something is developmentally or health-wise, the right answer always is it's a combination of genetics and experience, okay, always, okay. So there are genetic differences there, are, you know, for sure, but the key issue here is that children who are helped to get through and manage these stresses, to, to cope with them and to develop adaptive mechanisms will basically be less likely to have problems later on. We know that, we've known that for a long time. Why? Well, now I'm getting into the areas of hypothesis, okay? This is the frontier of this kind of research now. Maybe it's because those relationships in helping kids to cope help to get their stress response system back to baseline faster. And the sooner you can get that back to baseline, the more you're protecting the body from damage. Particularly, the best studied part of this is cortisol, one of the stress hormones which we know very clearly is damaging. It suppresses the immune system. It's damaging to the brain. In fact, the part of the brain that's most vulnerable to elevated cortisol is the hippocampus. It's very sensitive to elevated cortisol. And if cortisol stay up for a long period of time, it, it, it kills brain cells in the hippocampus and it disrupts circuits in the hippocampus. Very compelling hypothesis. Maybe that's why children who experience so much adversity have more problems learning and more problem with development. It's not just a distraction issue. There may be real disruption of circuitry at very important periods early on when those cortisol levels are not coming down. That leads us to the third 
level of stress that we call toxic stress. And somebody said, like, oh, toxic, that's a pretty powerful term. I go, I, what are you saying, that kids' brains are being poisoned? And the answer is actually yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is not an external poison, not like mercury or lead or organophosphate insecticides, but elevated cortisol that stays up is like an internal poison to the brain. It disrupts brain circuits. It kills brain cells. And this is the kind of toxic stress is what you see with this prolonged activation of the stress response system in the absence of any kind of stable protective relationships. Abuse, chronic abuse, chronic neglect, chronic exposure to violence, living alone with a parent with a substance abuse problem who cannot respond to your needs, or a mother with severe depression who loves her child as much as anybody else but cannot respond because of her illness all the time. The brain is expecting response. The brain is expecting protection. When it doesn't get it, the stress response system is activated and all these things happen and it does damage. No question about that. The unanswered questions are what are the exact mechanisms? How much is cortisol? How much is interleukin-6? How much is another inflammatory cytokine? Let the scientists worry about that. For our purposes, there's no question and no scientist will challenge the fact that bad things are happening to the brain when the stress response system is chronically activated. No question about that. So here's what it looks like. Here's a schematic. This is a kind of a normal cell with its, with its dendrites and axons, its connections. And this is a cell experiencing toxic stress in both the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Look at the difference between the density of the connections. You actually see thinned out connections in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex in brains that have experienced toxic stress. Here's a real picture, okay, of a neuron with its connections. In the normal case, all these little extensions coming off are little um, dendrites, axons. You see in the damaged neuron, you just have fewer of those connections. This is real, I'm not making this up. It's real, literally you can see in the brain's cellular architecture the effects of toxic stress. This, this is taken from a um, study that many of you are familiar with in Romanian orphanages that Chuck Nelson and Charlie Zena and Nathan Fox and others were involved in. This was a random, this was a study um, that did extensive developmental testing and some neuroimaging of children living in highly deprived environments from early infancy in orphanages in Romania where there were no alternatives, there was no foster care system. So a study was set up that actually studied the children as they were growing up and then created a foster care system where there was nothing. There was no alternative. There was no place for these kids to go. And a foster care option was set up and children were randomly assigned at the beginning. Half went into foster care at different ages and half stayed in the orphanage. And among the things that were done were doing EEGs of the children, and this is the three across the top, these are different frequencies of EEG. Children who remained institutionalized, children who had never been institutionalized, who lived in families from birth. The deeper the color, the higher the voltage. The deeper the red, the higher the voltage for these three different frequencies. I think the message here is fairly dramatic. Um, children who were never institutionalized had kind of higher voltage in their EEGs reflecting electrical activity in the brain compared to the institutionalized children. This is in the first couple of years of life. Take home message, the, the, the depriving effects of institutional, institutionalization were like having a 25 watt bulb for a brain instead of a 100 watt bulb for a brain. This is literally real. This is not something made up. This is what happens from gross deprivation. How do we generalize this to varying degrees of neglect in family situations and community situations are different from an institution. We have to be very conservative about that. We don't know exactly. But one thing this is showing us is that severe deprivation does damage to the brain. Here's the brain architecture for memory and learning. Notice anything funny about this? It's the same, same architecture, right? Anxiety and fear, it's the same architecture. It's the same circuits. They're affecting both. So when we talk about the importance of, of attending to children's emotional well-being, not just their pre-academic skills, this is not like a touchy-feely nice thing to say. 
This has to do with the biology of learning, the biology of fear. They're intertwined. You can't separate them. So let's get to policies now and finish up. That's my, the, the, the basic science is over. So now, how do we translate into policies? And also, I will tell you, I mean, from my perspective, my role is not to say all that and say, therefore, you should put X million dollars into this and X million dollars into that. That's, that's a political decision. That gets decided in the political process. Um, but what we can do in trying to make science relevant and useful in, in policy analysis and in political decision making is to try to extract some principles that could guide good policy making and good practice so that we're being driven by good knowledge, recognizing that science can't answer the budget question and it can't answer all of the intervention questions, but it can bring you to a place where you're operating within an environment where you're, you're really grounded in strong knowledge and then make decisions as opposed to make some decisions that seem to show no understanding of some basic knowledge whatsoever. That's, that's my goal. Okay. So for starters, public policies can make a big difference in a range of areas by protecting the environments in which children live because the environments in which they live have an impact on brain development. And I'll show you two pictures to illustrate two ways to think about the environment. This is a, this is a child on the grass outside a school, a young child. She's not an infant, but she's not in middle childhood. What does this have to do with public policies? Well, something I haven't talked about this morning, <coughs> but I'll mention right now is that as much as experiences shape brain development, there are other physical influences in the environment that could shape brain development, like toxins. There are toxins in the environment that basically are highly disruptive to brain architecture, like lead. Everybody understands that lead hurts brains. Mercury um, and a variety of other substances. Well, one thing that policies can do is, for example, some states have policies that limit the kinds of insecticides you can put on the grass outside a school where kids are sitting and breathing and absorbing all that stuff. And others say, you know, not my business. Okay, there's an example. There are public policies around the environment and physical pollutants in the environment that are either increasing or decreasing the likelihood that children's brains are being hurt. And the problem with neurotoxins is that the younger the brain, the more vulnerable it is. So I, as a non-pregnant adult, can eat all the tuna fish and swordfish I want and not worry because the mercury that's in there is not gonna hurt me at this point in my life. If I were a young child, um, eat, ingesting too much of that mercury could actually threaten my brain development. And if I were a fetus or an embryo and my pregnant mother were eating a lot of this stuff and the mercury was coming in, my brain is really gonna be hurt by that, okay? So we can't, what's safe at older ages is less safe as kids get younger and even less safe during pregnancy and policies can address that. You know, if we spend all our time talking about interactions and relationships and learning opportunities while kids' brains are being poisoned by toxins, that's not too smart. So that's kind of one area of policy. But the other area of policy, obviously, is the environment of relationships in which kids live. And I don't have to tell you this, that the environment of relationships that increasing numbers of kids in our country live in involve lots of people who are not members of their family. Okay? And the brain is not saying, um, now I'm at home, now I'm in a <coughs> childcare center, now I'm in a preschool program, now I'm in an early intervention program. And the brain is just saying, I am in a place and there are people around here and things are happening <coughs> and it's affecting my brain architecture. So it's, when you come right down to it, it's the environment, it's the physical environment in terms of its physical safety and the environment of relationships in terms of its impact on brain development that policy can have a lot to say about whether it's early care and education, or whether it's housing, or whether it's public welfare, or child welfare, or environmental protection, they all ultimately can affect the development of the brain. 